we're going to tag team uh, this presentation. First, uh, thanks, Tom, for that Thank great. Uh, one thing I'd add to that is that uh, we also did mix Corner Gas, that's actually just out of theaters right that's now, right. in Atmos, just so that uh, you know the, the intention here is to bring Atmos not just to the, sort of the big Hollywood type features, but to also Canadian features and to Canadian filmmakers. Uh, I'm Nick Ainelli um, from Deluxe. Thanks for uh, coming out, everyone. We're uh, excited to all have you here and to show you our facility. We're incredibly proud of it. It's been uh, sort of a bit of a long journey to get to this stage, and uh, the end result uh, from staff and clients and everyone uh, has, has just been uh, really great. So uh, we're, we're excited to show it off tonight. Uh, the one thing we just want to cover off is, I know most of you, when you think about Deluxe, you think about Deluxe as a post-production facility. But we're, we're more than just that. And we just wanted to sort of give you a little bit of insight into some of the different things that we do here. Uh, so definitely post-production, we service features, television series um, <clears throat> from the, you know, from their production stage. So for on-set shooting, we provide them daily services, either in facility or in a near-set environment. And actually in a, in a few weeks or new in the new year, we're going to be rolling out a Mercedes Sprinter van that will actually do your dailies right there as well, right uh, wherever your on, on location you are. Uh, in addition, then, we provide visual effects services, conform online color correction, TV features. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of an overview of the entire post services. Uh, but then there's media services that uh, Jeff heads up, and I'll turn it over to him to sure. hear a little description. So media services takes the finish of produced master, uh, and we're responsible for the distribution which uh, in the last 20 years has been mostly videotape. We manage about 300,000 videotape masters in our libraries do global distribution on that. But in the last five years, that's migrating very quickly over to, uh, to encoded files. And the client is changing. We don't have as many foreign buyers of the content. Now we're uh, delivering libraries to Netflix, iTunes, uh, Google, YouTube, Xbox, PlayStation, whatever. Those are becoming the uh, the primary clients for our clients for where their content goes. Uh, we also do DCP mastering and we provide uh, DCP distribution out of this facility. You'll see that. It's very unimpressive compared to the lab tours when they were doing uh, film distribution, what was all involved there. Uh, it basically now occupies a corner of the room, but we are responsible for most of the features that go out on DCP across Canada. And then we also have a totally separate division which is involved in content protection. So this is home to Deluxe's anti-piracy efforts. We have a team of about 25 analysts who are employed by all of the studios, the MPA, mini majors, uh, different premium channels. They hire us for consulting services, monitoring services for uh, piracy. And we also have watermarking. So we'll show you that. We do about 90% of the world's Academy screeners, award screeners. These are the screeners that go out around this time of year so that people can vote on awards, uh, best actor, best picture, whatever the case may be. Those are all made here. Each one's individually watermarked. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, we have the Content Protection Services Division, we have Media Services, and we have Post. And the new, uh, and then also in the new year, uh, we're also launching an Ad Services Division. Uh, basically uh, delivering ads to uh, to the broadcasters using a, uh, a platform called Javelin uh, that uh, it is, uh, comes out of the U.S. It's, it's a joint venture between Warner Brothers and Deluxe. Um, so we're hopefully delivering to various TV stations uh, in town. Turn it over to Greg, who's so going to start the... I'm, uh, I'm Greg Hall, VP of Engineering here. So I run the team of engineers that basically services both of these guys' departments. So we take care of the whole facility and keep things running. Uh, I know we're a little bit behind schedule and there is a Leaf game getting out at 10 o'clock, so we'll try and get everybody through. We're, what we're gonna do is just run you through a really quick overview of the facility, kind of how we got from where we were to where we are. It takes about an hour, just kidding. Uh, just so that we can get you going and, and, and get you guys through. So uh, we were at 424 Adelaide uh, Street East since 1987. 27 years at that facility. Two-story, 
brick and beam, really kind of a quaint little place. We loved the building. It went through a lot of changes over the 27 years that we were there. By the time we moved out, the roof was littered with air handling units, and we had machine rooms tucked into corners, and you know, we, we really used up every square foot of that place, but we did outgrow it. And uh, with this new facility that you'll see, we did uh, have the ability to kind of design this from the ground up in a nice, clean, empty space. So that was our facility over at 424 Adelaide. Uh, we went through, well, sorry, the reason we moved out, uh, it's, it's obviously we're in great need of condos here in Toronto. So there's another one going up on the footprint of where our building was there. So we had to be out uh, end of February of this year. So the last few years, actually back as early as 2008, We've been going through the process of looking at over 55 realistic properties for where we could have landed and, and called home. So we had some designs actually done as well early on. Film Court was an option, 284 King Street was an option. We looked at the Toronto Sun Building. Uh, Toronto Film Studios was also an option, but obviously we ended up landing uh, here at 901 King. Um, this building, as you'll see when you tour through, is a pretty impressive building. It's uh, an eight-story building. It's uh, post-tension concrete, which was different for us than we dealt with over for Adelaide. We've got two stacked uh, uh, computer rooms, basically uh, telco rooms, straight up right from the basement all the way to the eighth floor on both east and west sides. So cabling made it a little easier for us for two uh, to pull cable through the building and stuff. So, uh, but that could be quite impressive when you come through. So I drew the long straw, which meant I got the easy part of the presentation. Next, going to jump into the construction side to kind of give you an idea of what it's going to build this place. A bit of it, anyways. Uh, okay, so when we first started to to lay out and to sort of look at the build out and the design of the facility, we actually created a 80 page little book, little book, that was the whole for a bit. But basically, it was our master plan that we turned over to the architects. And that included a lot of detail, a lot of detail as far as how we wanted our edit rooms laid out, how we wanted our mixed theaters laid out, how we wanted the amount of risers um, within a room that would accommodate clients versus staff. Um, our shipping department, it was cr crucial that we had it located in a certain location so that when it's working with the other departments, it was able to just you know flow, flow nicely through, you know, just as, as far as workflow goes, uh, you know, <clears throat> Jeff mentioned the DCP drives, there's hundreds of those drives that go out every week. We needed to design and, and, and build a, a shipping department that could house that and, and really work throughout the facility. Um, obviously some of the uh, other <clears throat> big areas, you know, dealing with the natrium, it was light. Um, this entire building and the sort of circumference of the entire building, there's a lot of windows. We wanted to maintain that as much as we could. So in a lot of the edit suites and the color rooms, which is you know sometimes unheard of, but we left the windows in. We didn't sort of black them out. We do have 100% blackout blinds or 50% blackout blinds. So if you know staff do want do need to close down for a color correct session, they can do so. Our VDC as well, they have windows. Our dailies department, people that are working here overnight, they're now able to look out into the city. And I think just overall, you know, our, our staff feel much better. Uh, about working in an environment where they're not <clears throat> sort of in a closed-in room. We started our construction in uh, May of uh, 2013, and a big part of that was uh, the bump up. So when we first came to this building, we <clears throat> uh, one of the biggest challenges we had was where are we going to put our Atmos mix there? Where are we going to put mix one, as well as our DI room, which is our uh, feature color correction room? So we, um, in, in sort of we talk, talking to the landlord, uh, we convinced them that the only way we could actually move into this building was to take this glass curvature that existed. I don't know if there's a video here. We're going to play a little time lapse of that <clears throat> this glass curvature that existed on the eighth floor needed to come out. Um, that the roof that was 14 feet high also needed to come out. We needed to create a good volume of space. And so we needed a, a roof that was 34 feet high. And uh, and they agreed to all of that. So, um, and they actually took on um, that part of the build out themselves. Um, through it all, they ended up removing uh, 190 tons of concrete. 
in 1,400 uh, concrete blocks through the elevator. Because uh, they didn't want to sort of occupy the entire street in the back and, 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 and use a, uh, a lift to, to remove it all. So it actually was traveled all through, uh, all through the elevator. Um, additionally, so you can see in this slide here, uh, it doesn't show up that well, but there's the curvature of the old roof, there's the new roof in behind it. So once that exterior structure was put in place, then the dismantling of, of, of this all needed to, all needed to happen. Um, our, our partners in designing all of our mixed theaters uh, was uh, Pilcher Kuskuskul. Uh, Martin Pilcher did, uh, did all of our design, and Frank Reed from Progressive was, uh, was the company that did our build out of all of our, our mixed theaters and all of our rooms. Uh, kudos to them, they did a, an absolute amazing job. Uh, here's a, another in interior picture of, uh, of Theater One. Of course, in, in, you know, one of the biggest challenges in, in building out, uh, these are just some, some slides of, uh, of, of the mixed theater build out. One of the challenges in building mixed theaters in a multi-tenant building with an atrium is not just keeping that sound in, but also <clears throat> making sure it doesn't get out, making sure that the other tenants in the building, if you notice, there's, it's, it's, it's wide open up here. Uh, it's making sure that we're not bothering them, we're not interrupting them, especially when we're, in, when we're mixing a Saw movie that, uh, you know, a lot of screens and, and, and whatnot that happens in those type of, of pictures. Um, so that was crucial as part of the, the, the uh, mix room build out. Additionally, um, <clears throat> the move itself uh, was a very staged move. So we wanted to have as least impact on our clients as possible. So what, you know, the approach we did from mid-January to mid-February, we had to be out of our old place on February 28th. So we would bring down a room, move it over, get it operational, get it fully working, bring down another room, move it over. We could not impact our clients. We worked right through it. We had a lot of features. <coughs> TV series going on as we uh, were working through our move, but the impact on our client was, was zero. So we're all very proud of that. And, and really, um, the kudos in that sense goes to Greg Hall and the engineering team, uh, who did an absolutely phenomenal <coughs> job. This building and you know these three floors, as you walk through, it's really the hard work and sweat of, I'm gonna name them out, James Hodgson, Wayne Palma, <coughs> Phil Seal, Mike Sitnik, Andy Stott, Nan Tran, Jerry Gua, um, that's the engineering team here. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed Trevor Courier. Sorry, Trevor. Um, that's the engineering here team here at the Lux, and this place exists as it is today because of the tremendous work that these gentlemen did. So, I give that a turn it over to. So I thought to uh, just spend a few minutes talking about wiring. For the three quarters of you that find that boring, you can go to sleep right now. Some of you may find it exciting because I think it's exciting. It's one thing to build the building. There's nothing to raising a roof 30 feet. What's really <laughs> interesting is all the cabling that's got to go in, the different types of cabling, um, and uh, just the effort in uh, trying to get that done on time and on budget. because. The labor costs associated with that are uh, quite crazy. So I don't have lots of pictures of people actually putting connectors on wires because even I'd admit that's boring. Uh, we do have some pictures I'll just show you as we go along. But mostly I just wanted to throw out a few numbers and, and just acquaint you a bit with what went into here. Uh, what you're seeing here is the crack units. No, it's not that kind of crack. It's the, uh, it's the air handling systems. So we had to bring three of them up. Uh, by a crane, each one's 30 tons. Uh, so we have 90 tons, and that's just in our data center, which will show you part of it. Uh, we are fortunate here that we have high enough ceilings that we could, uh, we have plenty of room below, 18 inches below, to use the, uh, the floor as a plenum. Um, we have 424, 424 was our old facility. Uh, the facility started out as film house in 87. And it kind of grew into doing video stuff, and there's lots of analog cabling, and uh, 
analog equipment, and then it went digital, and then finally, somewhere in the 2000s, we start putting in a lot of data racks. Well, there's no room for the data racks anymore, so the data racks are everywhere. I mean, you open up what you think is a broom closet, and we could put a data rack in there, we did. So, one of the things that we really wanted to do here was to build a, uh, a room where all of the uh, data functionality, the data of the servers, the lab, the hot, uh, anything that humans don't need to touch, we can just put that all in one room, and that's what we did. So we'll, uh, we'll be walking by that and showing you that. Uh, in total, in our entire data center is 105 racks. Um, one of the things we learned was that proper data racks cost a whole lot more money than video racks, which, uh, when it came to budget time, was a bit of an eye opener. Um, you know, kudos to engineer guys; they kept pushing. You got to get proper data racks, which we did. Uh, so we landed up with uh, electronic metal form supplied our video racks as they have for decades, and uh, we went with APC net shelter racks for all of our uh, uh, all of our servers. Each of the racks, uh, the majority of the data racks, we do have uh, uh, tie lines for our CAT6, which allows us to uh, basically have the freedom to change up what's in those racks in the future. Nothing's totally hardwired to any one location. We started wiring off-site in May of 2013, and uh, that's because the building was not done. And then what we built, it was kind of weird to see, was uh, it's a wide open concept here. We built a room, which became part of our data center, and they were able to get into that room in August of 2013. Uh, FCI, Brian Fitzgerald's team, did all of our wiring. They're awesome. And um, uh, by the time we were done, we were in around 15,000 man hours to wire the facility, which includes install the racks and uh, dressing and routers, things like that. We went through uh, about 800,000 feet of cable in here, um, which is a lot of cable. I mean, it's, it's a big facility, but it's not that big, so we thought that was quite something when all was said and done. Uh, 150,000 feet of audio cable, 200,000 feet of video, and 450,000 feet of net, network cable and fiber. So, and all these were laid out on about 250 sets of drawings. As far as the router goes, uh, as our old facility grew up, we kept adding routers, so we just landed up with this, I'll call it the rat's nest, so it's not we ended up with a lot of different routers and a lot of tie lines connecting routers, which was not the most efficient way of doing it. So in this facility, we uh, we created a uh, an overarching software-based router control system, which uh, James and the team worked on for months uh, because you can make it anything you want to make it. And so they did all of the uh, uh, the design and the, the programming of our router, and that went flawlessly. Uh, and it tied all of the routers in the facility. We didn't have to throw them away, we didn't have to buy a brand new big one, tied them all together. Part of the challenge was, while we were building this place, we were still operating at the old place, so we could only go so far uh, before we actually had to move the routers over here so we could dress them in. And uh, fortunately, back at our old place, we, uh, we had normal patch, so we could use the patch panel still to, to uh, get by uh, during those few weeks. In this facility here, there is no normal patch. We're relying on the routers, but we built an architecture that should a router fail. We do have uh, uh, routers on standby, they're not the full size, but we can swap in uh, replacement routers. So that's the strategy uh, that we went with for routing. Uh, just a bit of a shout out to some of the companies that have helped. Uh, Nick has mentioned some. I just want to mention Quadrangle. Uh, some of you may be familiar with them. They've done a lot of uh, uh, facilities in Toronto. I think of course, and I'm sure there's a few other, but they're right in this building. They share seventh floor with us. Excellent, uh, excellent company to to work with. They understand our industry. Uh, Nexus, uh, excellent company to help you. If you're not an expert in construction, uh, they paid their own way and saved us a lot of money. Uh, 
kill him as general contractor was great. And I mentioned FCI and some others out there. So it was a real team effort. We were very happy with the team that we put together. So that's it um, before I talk about the <coughs> tour and what you see on the tour. Has anyone got any questions, which either I or what else like the engineers will answer? Question. Because you're in a multi tenant building, what do you do about power and fire? So we have, um, there's a backup generator. There's a generator in this building on the 8th floor. Uh, it's 700 kVA, which the building was only using about 150. So we've tied all of our key systems. Basically, the entire data center is on that generator with a large UPS between them. So we've got, uh, it's never been our intention in a, in a major power failure to stay in business. So we don't necessarily keep working in the rooms. The key for us was to have that backup power in place so that we don't go down to the point where it takes us three hours to get back up. So all of our key systems in a power failure stay running. We'll lose some lights. As soon as the power is back on, we're back up and running in a matter of minutes. And sorry, was the other thing? Fire? Fire protection. Yeah, the fire protection. I mean, we've got um, dual action systems in our, in our key rooms through the vault and through uh, the entire data center. Uh, so that's on its own panel, tied into the building panel, and, and uh, security obviously overlays that. Everyone in this room probably understands all the security requirements of the industry these days. And this place was built uh, with security in mind, not only just uh, for car readers and cameras, but actual locations of rooms and traveling of assets from one room to another. It's got to go from A to B to C, and that's the workflow for that asset, and those rooms are next to each other, so it travels. The assets don't move around the building. fiber for long runs where it was required so when we primarily when we had to go from the east telco to the west and when we had to go to the ground floor I think that's correct yeah. there's not a lot of fiber in here uh, the majority is cat six we continue fiber. to add it as necessary if we have needs for it in a particular quiet room then we'll throw more fiber in it but the backbone What a wonderful meeting, right? <laughs> they, uh, you'll be impressed with the tour. I've already had a sneak preview. Um, so let me hand these things. I will see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeff, where'd you go? There you are. Here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. Thank right. you. All righty. Okay, so I think what we're going to do here is we're going to try and figure out how to split the room in half. So 